Lord, we praise God for the opportunity yet again to bring to you Light of Light broadcast. We believe today you will be blessed. Just sit back and get your pen and paper if you can, or open your heart, your Bible, and let us get into the Word of God. May this challenge you, may this expand you, may this increase you, may this stretch you, may this be a blessing to you. To some of you, it's gonna be such a word that will turn around your life. And we believe Life Church International and our broadcast uh, media ministry, which is we call Light of Life broadcast, is gonna be a blessing. The broad overview of Romans has three major themes. The first major theme of the book of Romans is from chapter 1 to chapter 8. Chapter 1 to chapter 8 that deals with our relationship to God. How does man relate to God? That's very critical. Uh, secondly, we have a major theme between chapter 9 and chapter 11 of the book of Romans, which is regarding Paul's desire for Israel to be saved. The Jews. Paul's desire for Israel to be saved. Actually, chapter 9 to chapter 11 is a very deep theological uh, uh, portion of scripture that we will actually get into that to explain uh, what Paul says regarding Israel and the church. Then the last chapters from chapter 12 to chapter 16, we are dealing with uh, our relationship one to another. The relationship between believers, one and another, between chapter 12 and chapter 16. Let's begin by engaging the understanding of the board servant. Paul begins let this letter by taking a very low profile in the introduction. He introduces himself in a lowly way. I'm a servant. He doesn't first say I'm an apostle. First he says I'm a servant. That's a very good lesson we learn right there as believers. He is not trying to impress anyone by who he is or describing what he is. But first he says he's a born servant of Christ Jesus. Before he can mention his gift and his office as an apostle, he first of all says he's a servant of Jesus Christ. And that is a very good attitude that we need to pick up as believers uh, who are walking with God. He freely gives himself this title, board servant to Christ. The word board servant is a very critical word for the church. Especially when in times like this in the nation, when we are thinking about leadership and leadership in government and leadership in different parts of society, we need to see scripturally leaders ought to view themselves first and foremost as servants. The word, both servant, is the word doulos, D-O-U-L-O-S in Greek. Remember, the New Testament is translated from Greek. So the original language, doulos, which means slave. How does Paul call himself a slave? Because the guys he's writing to in Rome are basically Gentiles. And a Gentile mind of the Romans would see this as a slave, they would understand it. They would understand a slave is one who serves under debt. A slave is one who serve or used to serve under debt. So this translation of slave, doulos, is very accurate. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, the greatest servant, the greatest born servant in history was the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Actually, in the Old Testament, Jesus is prophetically described as God's servant. In Isaiah chapter 40 all the way to chapter 53, the suffering servant who ended up on the cross. When Jesus himself came on the earth, you remember? John chapter 13, he knows that it's time to go. So he picks a towel to wash his disciples' feet to serve them as a servant. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 20, the Bible says, himself says, I did not come to be served, but I came to serve. I declare to the church that it's important for us to put on this mind that was in Christ 
to be servants and servants of God. In Philippians chapter 2, we all know how this is put in chapter 2 verse 5 all the way to 7. Let this mind that was in Christ also be in you. We are told that Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a born servant and being made in likeness with men. Actually, the Bible says in verse 7, he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. Jesus set the example and the pattern as a servant. And I urge you, ladies and gentlemen, this morning in this service to begin to put on this. That was also on Christ, that we can be servants. And first and foremost, not servants of men, but servants of Christ. But also we know from scriptures, we are also referred to in the scriptures in many other words. Recently, over the lunch hour, we've been teaching the seven descriptions of a believer. One is a son, he's a farmer, he's a soldier, and on and on and on, he's a warrior and so forth. But there are also other descriptions because the Bible cannot be exhausted. Believers are called saints. Look at your neighbor and check whether they are saints. I mean, just by looking, you can't know. <laughs> they are also referred to as children of God. Or beloved of God. One who is loved by God. How many of you know that you are loved by God? It's amazing. Also Christian. We are called Christians as a ridiculing name. Taking the very name of Christ. Christ-like. Christian. The scriptures also say we are priests. Right? A priest without a caller, but with a calling. We are also called ambassadors. Ambassadors. We are also called friends. And many, many, many other wonderful titles that you are given. But Paul chooses to identify himself as a servant. How I pray that the church can set an example in this dimension uh, of calling ourselves and naming ourselves and how we looked at us, we look at ourselves. Praise God. It's great to be a servant. I say to you, it's great to be a servant. If you put on this, you'll be free to serve God and serve his people in the name of the Lord without having a problem. But if you think you are anything, you'll have a challenge agreeing to be a servant. If you think you are anything. It's a noble task to be a servant of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, I want to take this further and show you how in the mentality then, how a servant was described. A servant in this context, context is described in five ways. So that as believers, we can appreciate when Paul says a servant of Christ Jesus. Five ways, five ways to describe this servant. Number one, because the, the servant is referred to as a servant in a relationship to a master. So number one, the master has le a legitimate expectation of obedience from his slave. In other words, legitimately, the master expects the slave servant to obey. The question is, do you obey the Lord Jesus as your master? Do you obey? When he talks to you about prayer, when he talks to you about service, when he talks to you about giving, when he talks to you about abandoning evil ways and hearing his word and uh, patterning your life according to his desire. Do you obey? When he whispers to you in the morning, do you end up doing it before the end of the day? Or you have so much that is undone that you've never done and you haven't obeyed that is piling up in your path until you have been branded by heaven a rebellious child. May God have mercy as he helps us to obey our master. Secondly, the servant is described this way, that the slave has a legitimate expectation of provisions from his master. Oh, I like this. Is a servant. 
I know he will provide what he is supposed to provide as I stay in this house of my Lord and my but King. But number three, the slave is described as one having the primary duty to serve his master. That's your primary responsibility as a slave, to serve your master. You don't serve other people and other things. You serve your master. You can't be in this house of the Lord and you're serving another Lord in another place. You go live and stay where you're willing to serve and where you're willing to do that which God requires you and uh, put your hand into it Put your mind, your strength, your soul, everything into it. Serve your master with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. I tell you the truth. The master will be so happy with you. Let me tell you, scripture shows us many people that served well, though they were slaves. And favor came upon them mightily. One of them was Joseph. Even when he went to prison, he was made an overseer of the other prisoners. Why? Because God was with him. Just because he served well. He served well. Joseph served well. It doesn't matter where he was. The hand of God was upon him. He served well. Look at us. That are not even as it were in slavery and bondage in Egypt. We are in a free nation. We are in a free nation. We are in a free country. We are in a free church of Christ. We are in an apostolic church where there is a release of the grace of God. That all people can serve God without fear or intimidation. There is an opportunity for everyone. Don't you see? You have a primary responsibility to serve God is a serve. therefore the description of a slave while his primary duty is to serve his master his secondary duty is to serve the ones his master directs him to serve serving those whom you're directed to by your master that's a secondary duty to serve those whom the master has directed you to serve. Are you ready to serve those whom God sends you to serve? And let me tell you, scripture has shown and history has shown many times God will send us to a people we may not like or to a difficult task and, you know, responsibility. May you discern those whom God is sending you to serve. May you discern. And for the sake of you obeying the master, go and serve the ones your master directs you to serve. And number five, a servant is described as slaves of Christ who are supposed to please him while we serve one another. As slaves of Christ, we are to please him while we serve one another. When a slave is in the house of the Lord, serving other people that the master has directed, he is supposed to serve in such a way that the master is still pleased. Paul then says, called to be an apostle. Somebody say called. Let's get into this aspect of calling. Called. My God, called. The word called can be used in two ways. One is an official Royal invitation. The king has given you an invitation. He has called you. You have been given a card of invitation. Secondly, the word is used for the discharging of the duties of the office that you are called to serve in. So on one side, called means I've been given an invitation. On the other hand, it means I have a duty to discharge. I have this calling. May there be no one idol in the kingdom of God. May there be no one idol in the house of God. May the Lord mobilize you by the Holy Spirit. May you be awakened. Ah, my God. May he awaken you. Ah, the Bible says in Ephesians, Awake thou sleeper that sleepeth. Awake that Christ may shine on you. Awake and serve God. Arise and shine, the Bible says. It is time to lay our hand on the assignment that God has given us in his house. Let's do the duty that which God has given us. One day he's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. He will do that one of these days. 
accord. Now, if you look at this Romans in verses 6 and 7, you'll hear what he's saying regarding the saints. He's, he is, in essence, saying we are, we all, as believers, are called by Jesus Christ. And we are all called to a position that is of saints. There is a position called saints. This word called. And the corresponding verb to this word has three directions. The three directions for this word. Firstly, God looks back to our calling at salvation. Because at salvation, we were called. And every one of you has a date. You must know a time you were called. Secondly, looks ahead to our calling into eternity. Because we are called by Christ Jesus as saints, this looks also into the future. We are called into eternity. May you show up in the future where Christ will be gathering his people. Did you hear what I just said? May you show up on that address where he will be showing up with his people. It may be called heaven. Indeed it is. That word calling has this, that dimension. It looks now at our calling to serve. We are called now to serve in this present time. So when Paul says, a bold servant of Jesus Christ, called as an apostle. So it's very important to embrace this principle in the calling. That our calling or purpose in life is directed by God and we are in his hands. Say my calling is directed by God. And I am in his hands. What he calls us to be and what he calls us to do is far more important than what man calls us to be and to do. Or even what man tries to call us to be. What God calls us to do and to be is greater. May each one of us understand the calling that God has placed upon you. Then Paul says, called to be an apostle. A calling as a gift and also as an office that we need to investigate. And I'll spend a few minutes to explain this word apostle because it's important. The Greek word is apostolos. Same spelling but T-O-L-O-S. Apostolos. The word apostle in Greek is apostolos which means an ambassador. One who has delegated authority. Are you listening? Who has delegated what? One who is an envoy. One who is a messenger. In those days, he was also the commander of a naval force. The navy, right? The commander. This word was used for high-ranking naval officers in the classical Greek times. Very high-ranking very high officers in the naval uh, force. They used to use the word apostolos. It's from the Greek word stolos. stolos. And stolos is military equipment or armament. Military expedition journey or voyage is a journey we are taking carrying arms to go and do a military expedition and whoever is commanding that troop is a, is a stolos. This word comes let me get to what we are calling advanced studies. I mean we want to get to the advanced studies. Hello? This word comes from the idea of a tail of an animal. 
So the military equipment, caravan or convoy, follows the troops as they follow forward. So the idea of the apostolic and the apostle is one who is commandeering a troop that is on a journey, going to do specific thing, and there is a column, and it's like a, 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 a trail of equipment at different levels, all following a command. So, there is no apostle without the armory and the equipment and the convoy in place, and the officers. And there is no apostolic company without a specific mandate we are going to do. God has given us authority. We are going there to accomplish a certain work for him. And there are dangers on the road and on the way. But we have the necessary equipment and the power and the firepower to destroy everything on the way. We have breakthrough. First Corinthians 12, 28 says, And God has appointed these in the church. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. It's very strange for the church, the general church, globally, to operate the church with the gifts we call then. After, instead of first. Did you get the joke? <laughs> then healings. Then build the church only on healing. And that is at the level of then. By die, later. But first things first, the apostles. To lay the foundation. To lead this troop and company. They are the vision of God. They bear the revelation of Christ. I will show you uh, in a moment some of the uh, requirements and some of the assignments of the apostles and the qualifications and some of the credentials. So, first apostles. Oh my God, that word first is the word proton. Proton. In Greek, proton meaning first in rank. Fast in order, fast in time. And I usually preach a message I call proton believers. You should be the fast type. The believers with the fast anointing, the anointing of the fast. The anointing to break new ground. The anointing to go where others haven't gone. The anointing to touch others what others haven't touched. Fast in time, the Isaka anointing. You know time and season, and you know it is time now to enter here, and you enter there, and others in your family and whatever have not even entered there. Be a proton believer. The apostles, or the apostle, is both a spiritual gift, and secondly, an office. Office meaning an operating zone, a zone where there are operations, diversities of operations, where the, this gift operates from. The spiritual gift was the divine enabling to function as an apostle. Divine enabling, write that, divine a gift is a divine enabling. You are enabled divinely by God. I tell you the truth. The things we do, unless God divinely helps us, is not possible. Because Ephesians 4.11 says, He gave some to be apostles. He, Christ, gave. If you are given, it will come with a divine enablement. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us the spirit of fear. Because God gives something. He gives some stuff, right? The verses before are saying, do not neglect the gift that was imparted to you by my laying on of hands, for God has not given us spirit of fear. What he is saying is, when I laid his hand on you, God gave you something. 
when I laid a hand on you, God, I pray that God will give me an opportunity to lay a hand on some of you. Then God will give you. Ah, oh, yeah. Me, I'm just laying a hand, but God, and he will not give you a spirit of fear. And secondly, it's not only a spiritual gift, it's the office of apostleship. The office, the key word there is office, because the office comes with the authority to function. There is divine enablement, and then there is the authority to function. Father, we give you praise. Thank you, O oh God. And now, if you're not born again, why don't you pray with me? Say, dear Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died and rose again. I believe you need me. And now I come with all my heart. Forgive me and wash me with your precious blood. And let me never be the same again. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I tell you, the gospel is amazing. The word of God is amazing. It doesn't matter how, uh, you know, you take it, but if you take it rightly and with the right attitude, it will change your life. And I believe something good has happened to you. And so may God bless you and keep you. We're going to see you next time. Uh, stay tuned in. And hey, let us know that it is changing your life. It's blessing your life. Write us an email, like, write us a text or a letter or on Facebook or whatever. Go to our website, uh, Life Church Kenya, and let us know uh, that you're being affected greatly by this message. For the glory of God. In Jesus' name we bless you.